Overview of World History Part 1. This video is intended to give you an orientation in space and time for all of the things we're going to study in world history in the first semester. Starting from Christopher Columbus. People in the 1400s did not think the world was flat, even if that's what you learned in third grade history class. People in the 1400s in Europe, in Africa, and in Asia knew that the world was round. And I've tried to illustrate here with this combination of two maps that the people of Europe and the people of Asia and the people of Africa knew all about each other. The Silk Road and Swahili traders and Arabic traders traveled from place to place in all of those places. They all knew all about each other. The thing they didn't know about was the Americas. They knew the world was round, but they thought if you left Europe, you would have to go really, 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 really far until you got to China or Japan. And by that point, the sailors would starve to death. What Columbus proposed is that instead, Japan and China were much closer than they actually were. And when he arrived in what is now, we know, the Americas, he thought he was in the Indies, in these islands south of Japan. This follows up with the question about slavery. Why did Europeans enslave Africans and bring them to America? The short answer is economics, money. The Europeans, mostly Spanish and Portuguese speaking, arrived in the New World after Columbus and they wanted to get rich, so they demanded very quickly that the native people give them riches, gold, spices, and other resources. The Europeans had a uniquely violent culture from years of wars and the Crusades. And so this very uniquely violent culture was able to take advantage of the rationally peaceful indigenous Americans. After the indigenous Americans died uh, from disease or warfare against the Europeans and 90% of them were gone, the Europeans needed new people to do their work. So they went to Africa. This new slavery of abducting and enslaving millions of captives from West Africa was new and different from any kind of slavery that had existed before this. They were treated like animals or worse. Atlantic slavery here from West Africa to South America, Central America, and North America was different in scale and, se and severity and inhumanity. Then that leads us to the question of how did those colonies in America lead to scientific and industrial revolutions in Europe? Those colonies in America worked by slave labor made a lot of money for the owners. The people who owned the colonies were able to ship goods back to Europe and also ship money and gold and silver. And these ships full of money, gold, silver, rum, sugar, tobacco, and other things led Europe to become very wealthy. And so then people in England and France and the Netherlands and Spain suddenly found themselves very, very wealthy. And wealthy people have time and money to get an education and to study things. So Europeans study and think and invent because they have time and they have money that they stole from the indigenous Americans and from the Africans whose labor they used. You can see here this timeline in the year 1475, 1500, 1525, right about when Columbus was discovering America, there's only one famous scientist in Europe. But then in the generation after that, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, dozens of famous scientists who discovered and invented and changed the world. These men, and they were all men, were not smarter than the women around them. They were not smarter than the Africans or the um, Amerindians. They just had more money and more time. 
cash crops, gold, and other wealth flowed from America to Europe. The different European countries stole the wealth from South America, North America, and Africa and brought it back to Europe. Spain took wealth from all of these areas in purple, France from the areas in yellow, England from the areas in green, etc. Once that money arrived in Europe, those Europeans became very, very rich, and they started to have time to sit around and debate things and think about things. And you have the change of culture, where in the 1500s, you have Martin Luther questioning religion, and then in the 1600s, you have Thomas Hobbes questioning government, and in the 1700s, you have Rousseau questioning the nature of man and state and countries and citizenship. These men would not have had time or money to do these things. These people would not have had time or money to do these things without the wealth, cash crops, and gold that, that was stolen from America and Africans. This brings us to three political revolutions at the turn of the 19th century. In 1776 and in 1789, very close together, the United States had a revolution against Britain. In France, they had a revolution against their king. And then very soon after that, and in some cases at the same time, the French colony of Haiti had a revolution against the white plantation owners. These three revolutions were very similar, but they were also very different. They were all fighting against tyranny, but it's important to remember that tyranny looked different for different groups of people. For these white men in what would become the United States, tyranny meant that the government was trying to take away your slaves and take away your plantations. In France, tyranny for uh, the peasants and the bourgeoisie was um, that the government was taking away your property, making you pay high taxes, and not allowing you to vote. However, in Haiti, tyranny for the enslaved and for the people of color and for the free Africans. Tyranny was literally losing all of your rights as a human being. How did those revolutions in politics then lead the British to colonize India? Whoa, we're jumping from America to India. Well, we go back one. Britain lost its colonies in America because they had their own revolution. And so they needed a new place to get cotton. Britain had invented cotton mills to make cotton cloth. This is a spinning machine. And they needed tons and tons of cotton, but now they can't get it from their American colonies. They need new colonies. So they turn to India, where cotton grows really well even today. The, ooh, I could use the pointer. Cotton grows really well even today. So the British businessmen go to India, they start out in Bengal, and they make business deals with local leaders to buy cotton and to set up plantations. And eventually they get more and more powerful and they establish their own private army to protect themselves from the locals. And then over time, they exact more and more control over the people and then they end up charging higher and higher taxes so that then the people growing cotton on the plantations have no time or land to grow food and a famine happened in Bengal. The famine was partially caused by drought, but it was made way worse. And the starvation and suffering was made worse because the British insisted they grow cotton and other cash crops instead of food. How was British colonization in India related to China? British colonization in India is related to colonization in China for the same reason as the cash crop of cotton, the cash crop of poppies. These right here are the opium poppies. And they were grown on plantations and they grew really well in areas of what is today India and Pakistan. In fact, it still grows really well in areas of what is today Pakistan and especially places like Afghanistan. These poppies can be used once they're dried to make 
opium. Opium is an extremely addictive drug that you can take in lots of different ways, but it's important to think about opium as a, the same drug as morphine and also the same drug as heroin. So you take opium to make morphine and you also use opium to make heroin. So it's a very, very potent and destructive drug, but it makes people feel really, really good. And there was a problem in China. People were becoming addicted to opium. In fact, starting in the 1600s, Britain was importing opium to China. And by the time we get to the 1800s, Britain realized they could make a lot of money selling drugs to the Chinese people. The Chinese government outlawed the sale of opium. It's an illegal drug. It makes you very lazy. And if you have any experience with people who are addicted to heroin, it can destroy their life and their ability to function. And so opium addiction increased in China. Opium imports increased in metric tons over the years. And so by the time we get to the 19th century, the Chinese government declares war on Britain to try to force them to stop selling opium in their country. The war ended up badly for China because they had older style ships and older style weapons, and the British had used their money that they earned from their colonies in America and India and selling drugs in China to invent better weapons, better ships, steam engines, cannons, etc. Then, not content to control India and China, Africa became the new target of colonization. And just because I've only talked about Britain doesn't mean France and the Netherlands and all these other countries are not still also colonizing places. So then our question is, why was Sub-Saharan Africa colonized in the late 1800s and not earlier like the Americas? Well, geography. Africa is full of very difficult geography for people to conquer. The Congo River has huge waterfalls, so you can't really take a boat up the river. The Zambezi River has huge rapids, which are super fun for adventurers today to go on trips and river raft. But if you're trying to take a boat up this river to move supplies around, it's very difficult. There are rainforests in the area of the Congo and Angola today, and they are really hard to slog through. There's a lot of bugs and a lot of disease. Also, uh, the very south of Africa has the Namib Desert, which is super dry and impossible to cross. But what the British and the French and the Dutch had by the 1800s was technology. They built railroads. And here you have a picture of a railroad cutting straight through the geography. And these little lines represent railroads going into Africa. So with the technology of the railroads, plus improved medicine, improved communication, and frankly, better guns and weapons, Africa was colonized by the Europeans in the late 1800s. That's where we're gonna end part one, and that is everything that we hopefully will learn in the first semester of this year. At that point, the world is gonna go into world war and the 20th century, which is more complicated and is a story for another day.